But let's go ahead and pray, and we'll get into the message this morning. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for bringing us together um, and giving us a cool place to, to be in. Um, Lord, we pray that as we spend this time with you and one another, that, Lord, that you would speak to us, that we would have ears to hear and minds to conceive and hearts to receive what it is that you want to say. And then, Lord, that we wouldn't only just be hearers of the word, that we'd be doers, that we would go out and we would make an impact of love and grace and life in this world. We pray this in your great name. Amen. To take, to take, before we actually get into the message, I want to um, speak about something that's relevant to the message um, and that helps, I think, put some context to it. Um, it we're going to be looking at John uh, chapter, uh, chapter 11 today. And um, in that, we're going to be looking at the seventh sign that John gives in his book. The seventh sign. And there are two things about that seventh sign that I want to make sure we understand as we go into it so we have this context in our mind. First, I want to remind us that when John uses the word sign, he uses it in connection to Jesus' miracles because those miracles are signs to point us to who Jesus is. And throughout the book of John, we find out that Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Logos, the light of the world, the living water, the creator of the heavens and the earth, God in the flesh, the great I am. And so he wants us to know that. All right? And then the second thing I want to remind us of when it comes to the number seven, the number seven in Jewish numerology is the number of perfection yes. and completeness. And so in John's mind, as he gives us these seven signs that point to who Jesus is, it's so that we, with our eyes and our ears and our minds and our hearts, if they're open, we will have a perfect image, a complete picture of who Jesus Christ really is as God in the flesh. And so with that kind of a setting, if you would, theological setting in our minds, today we're going to be looking at John chapter 11. John chapter 11 creates a scene in Scripture that almost every single one of us in this room has seen and experienced. And that's the death of a loved one. For some, he is a son. A son who died too early. For others, he's a brother whose illness should have never been terminal. For others, he's a friend. A friend that they thought they would never ever see again in this world. What none of them know is that when Jesus arrives on the scene, He has come on a mission. He has come on a life-saving mission. Now, with that introduction, let's actually begin in John chapter 11, verse 1. And verse 1 says that Lazarus of Bethany was sick. And with him were his two sisters, Mary and Martha. Now, Bethany was, is, it was in is this little village about a mile and a half outside of the walls of Jerusalem. And it was a very, very special place to Jesus. You see, after long days of teaching and healing in Jerusalem, after long days of being pressed on by the crowds, and after long days of more requests and more questions and more and more pressures for Jesus to perform just one more miracle, Jesus, just one more miracle, after long days like that, Jesus would often sneak away to Bethany where he not only found rest and refreshment from the crowds, but he also found fellowship and joy with his friends. And Lazarus was one such friend. We know two things about Lazarus from Scripture. Number one, he was well known. In verses 18 and 19, we find out that many came from Jerusalem to grieve with his sisters when he died. And second, we know that Jesus loved them. And we know that because three times in this chapter, in verse 5 and verse, uh, verse 3 and in verse 36, we're told that Jesus loves Lazarus. He loves Lazarus. This is a close and intimate friend of his. And so when Lazarus falls ill, there's no surprise that his sisters actually reach out to Jesus and they say in verse 3, Lord, the one that you love, is sick. Now, notice they don't directly invite Jesus to come. Why? Because friends, when you really love somebody, think about this, when you really love somebody and they're sick or they're hurting, what do you do? You go, right? You go. C.F. Andrews tells the story of two friends during World War II, or two, excuse me, during World War I that were serving together. 
One of the friends had become wounded and he was lying helpless in no man's land. If you remember the context of World War I, the Germans and the Americans built trenches. Yeah. And that land in between those trenches where they shot back and forth was called no man's land. Mm -hmm. Well, this guy's buddy is lying out there shot, wounded, in the middle of no man's land. And so his buddy climbs up out of the trenches with bullets flying all around him. And he crawls out to his friend. And when he finally reaches his friend in the middle of no man's land, that wounded man says, I knew you would come. I knew you would come. Mary and Martha knew Jesus would come. They knew Jesus was coming. And yet, what did he do? I mean, this, when Jesus gets word about his, this intimate friend, does he immediately pick up everything and go rushing off to, to Lazarus and say, no, that's not what he does. As a matter of fact, he purposely stays where he's at for two more days. And then verse 4 says, when he heard this, he said, the sickness will not end in death. Now, Jesus doesn't mean that Lazarus isn't going to die. That's not what he means. He means that this death is not going to be the ultimate end of this sickness. Instead, he says, the ultimate end of this sickness is going to be God's glory and mine. Now, why does he say that? Why does Jesus say that the ultimate end of the sickness, sickness is going to be God's glory and his? Well, I think there are at least two different reasons for that. First, Jesus knows, hear this, He knows that He is going to go and He's going to do a miraculous work in Lazarus' life. He's going to raise him from the dead. He knows that. Yeah. And He knows that when that happens, that He and His Father are going to receive glory. Second, Jesus, when Jesus says the ultimate end of Lazarus' sickness is for God's glory and mine, when He says that, it's because Jesus hears this. Jesus very much is aware that His glory, His ultimate glory, is tied to the cross. It's tied to the cross. For example, in John 12, 23, when some of the Greeks come to Jesus, He said in the context of speaking about His death, He said, as a seed must fall to the ground and die and produce much fruit. So the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. To be glorified. So how is Jesus going to be glorified? He says, by dying to produce much fruit. And so to be glorified, Jesus knows that He has to take up His cross. And friends, hear this. The same is true for you, and the same is true for me. The ultimate way that you and I are ever going to be able to bring glory to God is in the words of Jesus to deny ourselves, to take up our crosses daily and follow Him. Friends, that means that when sickness or persecution or some other type of pain or tension or turmoil comes into your life or mine, then you and I have at least three different choices. Number one, we can forget who we serve and we can serve ourselves and we can strike out and we can fight for our will and our way. Or number two, we can bury ourselves in our own little world of bitterness and resentment and anger and fear, just like many people are doing across America right now. Or we can honestly say, Lord, I don't want this cross. I don't want it. But Lord, even more than what I don't want, I want your will more than I want mine. And so Lord, help me. Help me to deny myself, take up my cross daily, and follow you so that it brings honor and glory to you. Now I want to share something with you that's, to be honest, is very personal. But it's something that I want you to understand. Over the last several weeks, I have been struggling. I have been struggling to deny myself, take up my cross, and follow Christ in ways that are going to bring Him honor and glory in the midst, in the midst of all the racial tensions and all the horrific terrorism that's taking place around this world. Racial tensions that are raising questions about racism and about social justice, and about the sacred value and worth of every single person and every single race of every single color. Yeah. And of the horrific terrorism that's breeding fear and anger across this world in the hearts and minds of people. Friends, when I look at those things, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to be honest with you. I can't fully wrap my mind around everything that's going on there. I can't. 
It, right now it is too crazy and confusing for me. But what I can tell you is happening to me is this. I am charged. I am emotionally charged up because I'm a protector. Yes. And hear me, that's not a bad thing for a shepherd to be, to be a protector, but I'm a protector. And so there's a primordial part of me that wants to take up my shepherd's rod and go out and beat down the wolves. Yes. I want to protect those that I love. I want to protect those that are hurting or mistreated or abused or bullied or killed. I want to protect them. For God made me a protector. And so when it's fight or flight, I can promise you through the years, it's been fight for me. Yes. It's been fight for me. And so I'm struggling. Because what does it mean for Derek? In the midst of all this crazy, confusing, racial tension and horrific terrorism, what does it mean for me, Derek, to deny myself? That means to not do what I naturally want to do. What does it mean for Derek to deny myself? And then what does it mean for me, Derek, to take up my cross? In other words, to daily do what I don't naturally want to do, to take up my cross. And then what does it mean for me, Derek, to follow Christ in ways that are going to bring Him honor and Him glory in the midst of all that's going on? To be honest, I don't have all the answers to all those kind of questions. But what I do have is something that you have too. I have and you have a God-given gift. It's a, a handbook for successful human living that we call a Bible. Yes. And in the Bible, God gives us a number of fundamental guiding principles that are meant to be applied in your life and mine in every situation of life, regardless of what the situation is. Principle number one is the great commandment. The great commandment in Mark 12. Jesus says this. The most important of all the commandments. You want to know what's important to God? Right here it is. The most important of all commandments is to love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, he says, love your neighbor as yourself. Another principle is the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. Jesus said, you've heard it said. Love your neighbors and hate your enemies. But I say to you, you want to be a Jesus follower? I say to you, love your enemies. Love your enemies and pray for those that persecute you. And then he says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Friends, if you and I are going to give glory to our Father in heaven, then Jesus says, others must see our good works. In other words, others must see how our lives, hear this, how our lives line up with God's principles, yes. with God's goodwill, with God's good way, not our will and not our way. In other words, others must see how our lives line up with His heart. Now, beyond the searching of the Scriptures, I want you to know personally that I have been passionately praying for the Holy Spirit to teach me in this time and to guide me in this time and to give me wisdom, which the Scripture says He will do. Why? So that I can live my life in a way that's going to bring Him honor and glory in this time. Yes. Not some other time. In this time. Yes. And also, I want you to know I am presently seeking wise counsel from other passionate Christ followers. Why? Because the Scripture encourages me to do that. Why? So that once again, I can live my life in a way that's going to give Him honor and Him glory in this time. Yeah. Friends, if your life, if my life, is going to give God honor and glory in this time, in this time of racial tension and horrific terrorism, then that means you and I are going to have to deny ourselves, pick up our crosses, and follow Him, or do not call yourself a follower of Christ. I don't know about you, but that's some heavy stuff for me. That is the stuff that's going on in our world right now. Rachel's tension and horrific terrorism. And so I'm going to do something different in the middle of the sermon. I'm going to invite every single one of us to just stop for a moment of prayer. Now I want us to ask God, if you want to be a follower of Christ, then the question is, God, then how do I... The way you made me in the context around me, how do I deny myself, pick up my cross daily, and follow you in this context? How do I do it in this day of racial tension and horrific terrorism? What does that look like for me to do for you?
so that I can bring you honor and glory in this time. Let's pray. God, I don't want to speak for everybody in this room, but for those who want to follow you, God, what does it mean? What does it mean to deny ourselves? To take up our crosses daily and to follow you. So that we can bring you honor and glory in these turbulent days that we live in. Lord, we invite you through your Holy Spirit to give us wisdom, to guide us, so that in this dark day, your light would shine before men and they would see our good works and they would give glory to you who is in heaven. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Now, back to our scene. Verses 6 through 8. When Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was at two more days. Stay connected here because this is why it's all going on. Why? Why does he stay there two more days? Because, friends, it is a part of a bigger plan and purpose that Jesus is working out in this world. Do not miss this. Amen. Do not miss this. Because that means no matter how crazy and how confusing things are in this world, God is always, hear this, he is always working a bigger plan and a bigger purpose for his glory and, hear this, for our good. Yes. Let me say that again. God is always in this world working a bigger plan and purpose for His glory and for our good. And then verse 7 says, after those two days, He said to His disciples, let us go back to Judea. Now friends, when the disciples hear this, they can't believe this. This is crazy to them. Verse 8, but Rabbi, they say, this is sure a while ago the Jews in Judea were trying to kill you. Don't you remember? They were going to stone you. They were picking up rocks to leave you laying on the ground. Yeah. In other words, Lord, what are you thinking? This isn't some act of bravery. It's not some life-saving mission. This is a suicide mission. What are you thinking? Friends, what are the disciples doing here? Think about it. What are they doing? They're trying to protect themselves and they're trying to protect Jesus, right? Yeah. But what are they really doing? They are questioning Jesus. That means, hear this, they're questioning God in the flesh, the Logos, the creator of the universe, the great I Am. Yes. They are questioning Jesus, and they are questioning His plan and His purpose. Have you ever done that? Yes. Have you ever questioned God, and have you ever questioned His plan and His purpose? I know I have. But friends, hear this. If you and I, hear me, if you and I will focus our eyes of faith on God and His plan and purpose, not just on what we can see, not just what we can comprehend, but if we will focus our eyes of faith on God and His plan and purpose, then someday, hear this, someday we will see, as He promises, how all things work for the good of those who believe and are called according to His purpose, Romans 8.28. Friends, Disciples have lost their focus on God. They've lost their focus on His plan. They've lost his, their focus on His purpose. And so in verses 9 and 10, Jesus gives them some words of assurance. You can look that up later. And then in verse 11, He says, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. He's fallen asleep, and so I'm going to go wake him up. Now, the disciples think that Jesus literally is talking about a literal sleep. And so, because they're all concerned right now and focused on not getting stoned, they don't want to go back to Judea. They're like, oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. He's just sleeping. That means we don't have to go. But then verse 14 says, Jesus spoke plainly. Lazarus is dead. And I'm glad for your sake that I wasn't there. Why? So that you may believe. Now, friends, what is Jesus doing here? He's saying, guys, I know you can't see right now my bigger plan and purpose in all of this. I know you can't see all that right now. But I have an amazing, life-saving plan that's going to cause you and many, many others to believe. And so he said, let's go see him. In other words, let's go activate this plan. And then Thomas, who's called Didymus, or the twin, says to the rest of the disciples in verse 13, or 16, then let's go with him. 
Let's go with him that we too may die. Friends, what's going on with Thomas? Thomas is depressed, he's discouraged, and he's disillusioned. Why? Because he is not using his spiritual lives to focus on God's plan and God's purpose. Instead, he is using his physical lives to focus on the things that are around him. And so he's depressed because he doesn't have an eternal perspective. He's disillusioned. He's discouraged. And hear this. So are Mary and Martha when Jesus finally arrives in Bethlehem. Friends, when Jesus finally arrives in Bethany, I believe that Mary and Martha are already in the stage of grief that psychologists call the anger stage. And the anger stage is where people are hurt and they're confused and they're asking questions like, why me? Or, or why my loved one? And why them? Why? And so they're hurt and they're confused by all the heart and there's bitterness and all, all kinds of stuff going on here. And other times there's brokenness and there's tears, there's confusion. These women are both hurt and they're confused. Why? Because they have both lost, lost their brother. And they both don't know why Jesus didn't come when he was called. Verse 20. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went racing out of the house to meet him while Mary stayed seated. You see, in the Jewish tradition of that day and of this day, after the loss of a loved one, the Jews sit in Shiva. And the Shiva is when the, the bereaved family for seven days will sit and they will mourn their lost loved one, never leaving their house. It's a time that friends and that neighbors come and they bring them food and they bring them sympathy and they bring them love. It was on the fourth day of Shiva, the fourth day of sitting and mourning. And yet Martha, when she hears that Jesus is on his way into town, filled with emotion. She gets up and she goes racing to Jesus and she brings him the questions of her heart. Yeah. Friends, do you do that? When you're angry, when you're tipped off, when you're troubled, do you race to Jesus and do you bring him the questions of your heart? Verse 21, she said, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. Friends, can you feel the emotion? If you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. And I want us to notice how Jesus responds. Notice he does not rebuke her for her accusations. He doesn't scold her. He doesn't put her down and put her in her place. No, instead, he calmly and compassionately gives her a promise. Verse 23, Martha, Martha, your brother will rise again. He will rise again. Friends, do you see the tenderness here? Jesus not only understands, hear this, He not only understands Martha's feelings, but He actually provides her with an opportunity to express those feelings. And when she's done, I don't know about you, but I can just see Jesus tenderly reaching out and taking Martha by the face in His hands. He loves her. Don't, don't miss this. He loves her. It doesn't matter that she came to Him with accusing words. It doesn't matter that she blames him for things that she does not understand. He loves her. And I get to see her grab him grab her face and say, Martha, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. And he who believes in me will live, even if he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Martha, do you believe in this? C.S. Lewis once wrote that there are two parts to us. One, for the mother that loses that little baby, there is that motherhood part of her that will never be satisfied, never satisfied with the long list of verses to claim. But then, there is that believing part of her, that eternal sense, where as a Christian mother, she releases and lets go. But not, hear this, not without anguish. I believe that's exactly where Martha is at, is that she's filled with anguish and yet believing. Verse 27 says, she says, yes, Lord, I believe. I believe. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into this world. And friends, when Martha came to Jesus, she came standing angry, standing bold, Needing words of support and assurance. And that is exactly what Jesus gave her. 
But notice, Mary comes in a very different way. Verse 32. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and she saw Him, she fell at His feet and she said, Lord, if You would have been here, my brother would not have died. Friends, those are the very same words that Martha spoke to Jesus. The very same words. But Mary brings them in a completely different manner. She doesn't bring them standing bold to challenge Jesus. She brings them prostrate on the ground. A sign of worship and respect. And point out her pain and point out her tears. Verse 33 says, Jesus saw her weeping. Jesus saw her. He saw her weeping. When my grandpa Bailey died in a tree cutting accident a number of years ago. I was 28 years old and he was one of my heroes. I'm not, I'm not kidding you. He saved my life on two different occasions. He was literally one of my heroes. After Deb and I and the girls got to Marysville, Ohio, in his hometown, I dropped my family off at, the, at my grandma's house and I said hello to everybody. And, um, and then I turned to Deb and I, and I asked if I could just have some time alone. And I wanted to go in the car and I wanted to go some places. And she said, yeah. And so I jumped in the car and I began to drive from place to place to place. And I drove to all the different areas, all the different places that Grandpa, my Grandpa, my hero, <laughs> used to take me. I drove to open fields and grading bins and different <laughs> woods, several different woods. And, and then I for sure went down that road he used to take us on when he would like accelerate really fast and hit that rise in the road and then it would like give you that tickle in your tummy. <laughs> I made sure I did that. <laughs> and in each of those different places, I stopped and I cried and I mourned and I poured out my pain. And you know what my Heavenly Father did? He went with me. He went with me. And He helped me and He listened to me. And He let me pour out my pain and not once, not once did He rebuke me. Not once did He say, there, straighten up. Stop it. Stop your weeping. Stop your crying. Stop your grieving. Not once did He do that. Why? Because He understood. And He was touched by my grief. The Apostle Paul never rebukes a child for weeping. A God, child of God to weeping when they lose a loved one. Never, never, never does He rebuke. But, as Shannon just read earlier in 1 Thessalonians 4.13, he says not to wail and to mourn as those who have no hope. In other words, he says, yes, cry, let it out, let out your pain, but don't wail and mourn like those who don't have any hope, like those who don't know the end of the story. Yes. And so friends, where do you think the Apostle Paul got an idea like that? From Jesus. From Jesus. Why? Because Jesus knows the end of the story. He told Martha in verse 25, He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me will live even if they die. Friends, Jesus, hear this. Jesus knows the end of the story because He is the end of the story. He is the resurrection and the life. And so, when He gets there outside of Bethany, and he's surrounded by Mary. And he's surrounded by all those other people that are weeping and mourning. Jesus doesn't say, stop it. Stop your crying. Stop your mourning. Stop pouring out your pain. No, why? Because he understands. And he is touched by the grief. But then verse 33 says, when Jesus saw them weeping. And hear this. The word that's used here is not some quiet tears of sadness. No, this is the word that's used in the Greek here is the explosive wailing and mourning of those, hear this, who have no hope. They have no hope. And so when Jesus sees her weeping and all the Jews who were with her also weeping, it says he is deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Now, that word deeply moved is the snort of a horse in battle. Mm. Or for us humans, it's an outrage. It's an anger. It's a fury of emotion. An outward... Argh! And then it says he's troubled. Which means that he's stirred. He's agitated like troubled waters. And so catch this. Jesus is ticked right now. 
He is stirred up and he's angry. Why? Because Mary and all the others are wailing and mourning as those who have no hope. Why? Because Lazarus has been in the grave for four days. And friends, the significance of that is this. The Jews of that day believed that the soul of the dead person hovered around their dead body for three days, hoping to re-enter. But once the decomposition of the body had taken place in the fourth day, the soul of that person was gone. It departed. There was no opportunity for life. It was done. Hear this. There was one exception. And only one exception. And that was if, if the Messiah was asking for a miracle. You see, the rabbis of that day also taught that there were four unique miracles that only the Messiah could perform. Four unique miracles that would help everybody identify who the Messiah was. And hear this, Jesus had already done three of them. He had already done three. And the fourth one of these four miracles that only the Messiah could perform was the raising of a dead person who had been dead for four days. Four days. And so when Jesus sees Mary, and He sees these people wailing and mourning as if they have no hope, He is ticked. He's angry. He's stirred up. Why? Because their hopelessness, hear this, their hopelessness tells Him it's evidence that they don't believe that He's the Messiah. And number two, hear this, as the giver of life, He is angry at death itself. He is angry at death itself, at the pain that it brings and the life that it steals. He is angry at death itself. And so he says in verse 34, where have you laid him? And they reply, Lord, come and see. Come and see. And then we come to the shortest, but I truly do believe it's one of the most profound verses in all the scripture. It says that Jesus wept. He wept. Friends, don't miss this. The all-powerful, all-knowing God of the universe incarnate in Jesus Christ. The great I Am looks upon the pain of these people and He weeps. He weeps at their weeping. Now, hear this. Not with the wailing and the mourning of those who have no hope. He weeps. In the Greek it says that He weeps with silent tears. Silent tears, tears of sorrow. Why? Because as he looks on Mary and those who are also weeping with her, he understands their pain. And he is touched by their grief. And when the other people around him, when they see these tears beginning to stream down Jesus' face, some of them say, see how he loved them, speaking about Lazarus. And others said, well, couldn't this man who opened the eyes of the blind, couldn't he have healed Lazarus and prevented him from dying? When Jesus heard this, the scripture says once again, verse 38, he was deeply moved. Deeply moved. Now stop right there. What happens when you and I are deeply moved? What happens when you and I are stirred up and angry? What happens? What happens is we're ready to do something, aren't we? We're ready to make a difference. We're ready to make something happen. We're ready for a fight. And that's exactly where Jesus is at. He is ready to do something. He's ready to make something happen. He is ready for a fight. Specifically, he is ready to fight for the life of Lazarus and for the faith of these people. Friends, hear this. One of the surest signs that God is working in your life, one of the surest signs he's working in my life, is when we are stirred up and ready to fight. Ready to fight for the life and faith of others. Friends, that's why God calls us to love our neighbors as ourselves. That's why He calls us to go into all the world and make disciples. That's why He calls us to extend His love and His mercy, His grace and His justice to others. Why? Because He wants us to fight. He wants us to fight for the lives and faith of others. And Jesus is stirred up. And so He's ready to fight for the life of Lazarus and for the faith of these people. Look at verse 38. It says, Jesus, once more, deeply moved, came to the tomb. Friends, that tomb is probably nothing more than a hollowed out cave with a stone, a stone that's been rolled in front of it. But do you know what that stone symbolizes? It symbolizes the end of life. The end of life. And when Jesus sees it, He says, get that thing out of here. Roll that stone away. But Martha, his sister, of course, is horrified. She, she's like, all she can think about is he's going to stink. Lord, he's been in there for four days. He's going to stink. 
And he may have still stolen. But Jesus turns to her and he says, Martha, didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Now, move that stone away. Now, question, stop right there. Why? Why take that stone away if Jesus is going to resurrect his body? I mean, a resurrected body doesn't need a stone to be rolled away. Remember when Jesus' stone was rolled away? It wasn't because they wanted to let Jesus out. It was so that dead people could get in. The molecular structure of a resurrected body is totally different than ours. Yeah. Jesus literally walked through walls after his resurrection. He did not need that stone removed. And so why are they moving the stone? Because hear this, this is not a resurrection. Lazarus is not going to get a new supernatural body on this occasion. It is a resuscitation yes. where Jesus is going to put life back into his body, his old body. Now, let me ask you something. What has died in your life? What has died in your life that needs to be resuscitated? What has died in your life that needs to have life put back into it again? Is it your relationship with God? What about your relationship with your kids, or your spouse, or your neighbors? What about your relationship with yourself, or with hope, or joy, or fulfillment, or your purpose? What has died in your life that needs to be resuscitated? Whatever it is, whatever it is, Jesus Christ has the power to bring life. Now, don't miss the drama of this closing scene. As the, as the crowd is watching and Mary is weeping and Martha is objecting and the others are rolling the stone away, Jesus is standing right there in front of the tomb, an open tomb. He first lifts his eyes up to heaven and he prays so everybody knows that he is his authority before God. And then when he's done, his eye, all eyes are focused on him and he shouts with a loud voice, the scripture says, Lazarus, come forth. And verse 44 says, that dead man came out. He came out. Friends, Lazarus had been dead for four days. He is bound, think about this, he is bound head to toe in 80 to 100 pounds of linen wrappings and hardened spices. But when Jesus shouts, come out, the dead man comes forth. Now, don't miss the very last words in this story. As Lazarus comes forth, and he's probably waddling, thinking about it. You know, think of the, think that picture, of that mummy that he is, he's walking out. And so he got this mummy coming out. Jesus turns to the crowd, and he says, unwrap it. Unwrap it. Take off those gray clothes and let him go. Let him go. Friends, as I mentioned in the very beginning, this is the seventh sign of the book of John. The number seven is the number of perfection and completeness. And so John wants us to know, he wants us to completely understand God's perfect plan that Jesus Christ came to give us life. And we are called to help unwrap one another. Think about this, do you realize that even though Jesus had just brought Lazarus back to life, do you realize that he would have died again right then and there if those people had jumped in and unwrapped him when Jesus asked I mean, friends, he was wrapped up from head to toe in linen strips, wrapped around and around again with hardened spices over in that linen. And so that means that if these people hadn't jumped in and unwrapped him when Jesus called him to, within a matter of moments, he would have suffocated. He would have lost the life that he had been given. Friends, hear this. Jesus gives life to people. And he's the only one who can give life to people. But when they receive it, if you and I don't help unwrap them from their pain and their poverty, if you and I don't help unwrap them from their unhealthy lifestyles and relationships and addictions, if you and I don't help unwrap them from their tragedies and their traumas, from their heartaches and their headaches and their hang-ups, if you and I don't help unwrap them through kindness and encouragement, through love and support, through justice and mercy, if you and I don't help unwrap them then the new life that they be given may very well be extinguished again. Now, let me close with this challenge. 
If you want to be a part of God's life-changing mission in this world, it starts by loving Him and loving others. It starts on a very practical level by praying and caring and sharing for those that God has placed around you. And it starts by going out into the world and making disciples. Friends, Jesus is the one who brings the dead to life, but we are the ones who unwrap it. We are the ones who unwrap it. And so as you begin to think about the people that God has placed around you and the places you live and work and study and play, as you think about those things, as you think about those people, as you think about the passions and the personality God has given you, then ask yourself, or better yet, ask God. Ask God, God, what do you want me to do? And how do you want me to do it? So I can be a part of setting your people free. Free. Let's pray. God, in this time of great racial tension and in this time of horrific terrorism, it makes us keenly aware of the opportunity that we have to let your light shine in this darkness. But Lord, we know we can't do it on our own. We know we need your guidance and we need your power through the Holy Spirit. And so God, we ask that you would empower us so that we can be used in this world to help unwrap, help unwrap people from the pain and the anger. Lord, from the division. Lord, help us to know how to unwrap so that your grace and your light can shine. Lord, we pray all these things in your great name. Amen. It's our tradition to close up with at least four different ways to respond to this God of grace who loves us and who invites us into a relationship with Him. The first of those ways today I want to introduce in this way. If you have anything in your life that's died and that needs to be resuscitated, Anything in your life that needs to have life put back into it, a relationship with God, a relationship with others, a relationship with yourself. Or maybe there's something in your life right now that needs to be unwrapped. Maybe something needs to be unwrapped in your life right now. I want you to know that there's going to be some prayer teams up front who are going to be there ready to pray with you. The second way is for us to come up front as well for a time of prayer, but this one is about prayers for yourself or for others. And I'm going to be honest, I think that there's some people in this room that have been willing to come up and have others have be stand in somebody else's place and say, I want you to pray for so-and-so with me. But there's some things going on in your own life that you really needed to be able to gather with two or three other people and have them pray for you. And so whether it's a physical thing or a financial thing or a relational thing or an emotional thing or a psychological thing, it doesn't matter. There's going to be teams up front that are going to be there to pray for you or to pray for somebody else that you bring forward in that time of prayer. And the third thing, of course, is that we have the baskets in the four corners so that you can give an offering today if you're a partner with us. And then finally, the fourth response that we have is actually given because of the, the invitation that Jesus Christ gives to you and to me. You know, I've always been captivated by the fact that at the Lord's Supper, the communion, the Eucharist, the 12 guys that Jesus has around that table with Him, there's not a one of them that didn't deny Him after that, table, after that occurrence. There's not a one of them that didn't run away when He was hauled off to go through His trials. Not a one of them. There was not one that stood up for him. There was not one that was faithful. So hear this. Communion is not about your faithfulness. It is about God's faithfulness. It's about God's unconditional love. And it's about His grace. But we also have to take a moment and check our hearts. And ask ourselves, am I really ready to receive what God wants to give to me? And this is what He wants to offer to you. And He wants to offer to me. On the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and he blessed it 
and then he broke it. Traditionally, for 2,000 years, the Jews at that point had said, Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who gives us the grain of the field. But that's not what Jesus said on that occasion. He broke with 2,000 years of tradition. Instead, he said, This bread is my body that's broken for you. Take and eat and be thankful. And then the scripture says that after supper, very specifically, after supper, he takes a cup. There are four cups in the Seder meal, the Passover meal. And the third cup that's taken immediately following supper is called the cup of redemption. It always has been called that. It always will be called that. It's called the cup of redemption. And Jesus takes this cup of redemption and he lifts it up. And for 2,000 years, the Jews have said, Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who gives us the grapes of the vine. But that's not what Jesus said on that occasion. He took this cup of redemption and he lifts it up and he says, this cup, this cup of redemption is now filled with blood. My blood that's poured out for you and the forgiveness of your sins. And so take and drink and be thankful. I want to invite you as you're ready to come and receive, to come and respond to this God who loves you. Who loves you.